Hi, I'm Jess. Hi, I'm Kristen. And this is Rediscover, a conversation where we travel through everything that makes up the essence of who we are and how to live authentically and imaginatively. Here, we invite you to join us as we explore and discuss a little bit of, well, everything. From Disney to cultivating your most authentic life to deepening your relationships and talking about the real stuff. We hope you'll find this a space that speaks to you, encourages you, and brings a little bit of magic into your day. Hi there, I'm Jess. Hi everyone, I'm Kristen. And welcome back to this week's episode of Rediscover. We have a very special guest joining us today, my really dear friend, Bobby Asin. Hello everyone. Thank you guys so much for having me on this week. We are so thrilled that you're here. We are here at Walt Disney World visiting Bobby who lives here in Orlando and it's a lovely Florida thunderstorm outside so if you hear some thunder in the background it's just some zen ambiance. The thunder is rolling in. Our timing is perfect. What could be more appropriate? Get cozy. (laughs) (laughs) So today we wanted to have Bobby on because he is who I consider to be someone who is very well educated on the Disney Asia parks. He is the person that I went to the Asia parks with. And we just wanted to use that as a discussion topic for the podcast today, because I'm sure that's something you guys have all been hearing about or wondering about. And we have someone who's really knowledgeable about that right here with us today. I love that title. (laughs) Thank you. Well, Bobby, I know you and I worked together a few times in the parks over the years, but you and Jess have been friends for a really, really long time. Do you guys want to talk about how you met? Yeah. So I actually heard about Jess in 2013 in my math class, my first period of math class. My friend Miriam showed me a girl named Jess who did the was it the diving experience, I believe, at Epcot? At the seas, I did the snorkeling experience. It was like a work outing. Yeah, I saw that. And then one day I saw a picture of Jess uh, having hoop doo do strawberry shortcake. And that was the day I followed Jess on Instagram. <laughs> I didn't know that, actually. I saw the post and I was like, oh, so we talk about everything she was doing in our math class. And then in 2014, I had moved to Orlando, Florida, and started talking to Jess a lot more because I was asking questions about different apartment complexes. Uh, And I had a college field trip at Epcot and that's the day I met Jess in person at the parks. Yes, and we went to Character Spot and... Mm -hmm. The Japan Pavilion to have dinner. Oh, that's really sweet. Yeah. Yeah, and just kind of walked around, got to know each other, but then we didn't see each other for many months. I think I went to Disneyland. You went to Disneyland and we were talking about it on Snapchat (laughs) back in the day. I think around March, our friend Taylor came down and we all hung out in a group and Mm -hmm. we've just been really close ever since. Yes, and we've been to every park in the world together besides Paris. So that should be our next trip post-COVID. We've traveled a lot together. We've gone to California. We've gone to Asia. We've lived together at one point. Yeah. You were... Oh my gosh, I forgot, I forgot about that part. <laughs> you were the one who got me to come back to Orlando after going back to school. Yeah. And you were the gateway to that. So thank you. And yeah. We've had a long, beautiful journey. Yeah, all thanks to my friend Miriam, honestly. Yeah, exactly. Thanks, Miriam. Yeah, thanks, Miriam. <laughs> Shall we get started on our Asia discussion? <laughs> yes, let's get started. Okay, so I guess when we kind of thought about doing this episode, we thought about the whole entire process of not just traveling to Asia, but planning and packing and all of those things that people kind of start to feel overwhelmed by. Mm-hmm. So I guess what we want to know first is what are the first steps you would take when you start planning a trip to Asia? Yes, so the very first step that we took was definitely looking at all the different types of visa applications you need to go through. Sometimes if you're in certain areas of Asia, it would become a tourism visa instead of a traveler visa. There's, you know, they sound very similar. There's a difference. So you definitely want to make sure that you're following the right steps. That way you aren't breaking any laws. And so that's very important. And then when booking your reservations, it's actually helpful to call the hotels or anything else you're trying to book. And something I found very helpful was using the Line app. The Line app, you can pay a penny per minute for international calls. So we were able to call overseas, 
there was always a translator, especially at all the Disney resorts, outside of Disney as well, even in Beijing, they always had a translator who was able to help. And that way you could really understand the discounts or the offers that are included in the room, whether it's breakfast or if you book by a certain day, you get a free upgrade. If I didn't call through the line app, I never would have learned what deals to take advantage of when booking our vacation. So get that line app. Yeah, that was very, very helpful. That's a great tip. And then obviously remember the time difference. (laughs) So yes, it's about a 12 hour time difference for China. And I think it's 13 hours for Tokyo. So what if it's nighttime, it's their morning. If it's your morning, it's their nighttime. (laughs) Exactly. And then we definitely used a lot of different blogs. I think my favorite one is the TDR Explorer. Definitely check him out for all things Tokyo. We'll link that one in the show notes for you. Yeah. And luckily we had our friend Akio Akimoto took us around to a lot of the different locations from Tokyo to Hong Kong to Shanghai. She was there with us. Her Instagram is official Akio. She's one of our really, really dear friends. Well, yes. Bobby, you met her first through Instagram, right? Yeah, I met her through Instagram. I was in high school, so long time, but she takes uh, a lot of park pictures she has an account that's dedicated to just her character photos and disney park photos which is fans fk so if you ever want to see some cool park pictures of the entertainment offerings they're on there as well we were also talking about learning about transportation options too yes especially in asia you have a heavy focus on trains and buses there's always the option to take a cab Something that we learned from going to Hong Kong and Shanghai, the people at the Welcome Centers were warning us that we would be taken advantage of in the cabs, and that definitely is true. There tends to be a thing where they tell you the set price to your location before you get into your car, and then once you make it out of the track of the airport, they tell you what the real price is going to be, and it would equate to probably over $100 in American, when it really should have been about 25 in American. So just look out for that. I recommend that if you have a hotel that has a bus or a car service to do it through that. When we left Hong Kong and Shanghai, we actually did get a car service. That way we already prepaid. That way we didn't have to worry about anything. And then plus having a car service was very helpful because you knew they were going to be there on time and they always had the appropriate room for your luggage. So there was no surprises when going back to the airport and they know the terminals and everything pretty well. And one of the services that we were able to use that's similar to Uber or Lyft in America is DD in Shanghai. So that's one to look up as well. So it's almost like when considering, I guess, where to stay, even though more of like a resort or inclusive experience might be more expensive for your peace of mind and for being able to navigate the language barrier and not be taken advantage of by cabs and stuff like that, it's almost worth the higher price point to know that you're not going to run into those issues. Oh, definitely. I think so for sure. Mm -hmm. It definitely is about the quality when you're spending the money. I mean, if you're going to be spending $100 on a cab, you might as well spend that money on a nice hotel. Yeah. Yeah. And I feel like ultimately we definitely hit some hiccups during the trip, but our transportation, we were able to navigate eventually and didn't have too many problems with it. Yeah. The main problem we had was, I would say in Hong Kong, trying to get a cab home back to the resort it was at a point where it'd be like 20 cabs like passing by and having no luck that was funny that was in the city too so that was a little bit that was at the peak Mm -hmm. which is where you could see the whole skyline of the city of hong kong and another important thing that we learned to do ahead of time is definitely look at all the cultural norms of each area we learned that you know customization for food is not very friendly some areas just don't change the food. I remember we went to a ramen bar and Jess was trying to order. She would say, can I have this without egg? Or can you make this without egg? And they would say, yes, we can make it without egg, but we don't. 
Like, we won't do that. <laughs> they, like, went out of their way to be like, yes, but no. Yeah, they're like, no, like, she's like, no, I, I want it without egg. Like, yes, we could make it without egg, but we don't do that. But no. They go, it's always this way. And it's not even pre-made. Like, they would make it in front of you. Basically, before this trip, I would never eat fruits or vegetables. I'm a very, very picky eater. Wow. I got to the point when I left Asia that I was able to eat anything without asking what was in it. I just would eat it because I was having eel and everything by the end. I didn't care. I was like, they think I'm being rude by asking to move this stuff around. I'm just going to eat it. And if it's bad, it's bad. And there was times when we'd be in the city where there wasn't a menu in English and there's just pictures. I'd point at it and be like, I want that. Number two, please. And <laughs> call it a day. I remember that. I think you got to a point because you were very picky at the time about mm -hmm. eating you're like well i'll try everything once and by the end you were eating anything everything, and everything yeah that's amazing so it forces you out of your comfort zone definitely that's a good growth experience there's a lot of different things in the cultural norms that are very handy to know yeah for sure that's just one of many it's definitely really important to research cultural norms of japanese culture chinese culture before you get there because you want to be respectful yeah and also be respectful in the fact to know that they are separate i feel like people yes. tend to just put that all together and it's so different mm -hmm, very and then another thing too at the time when we were traveling there we were cast members so one thing we were looking into was cast member benefits. So if you are a cast member when you're traveling to the Asia parks, you typically, as of when we went in 2018, you get admission into Hong Kong Disneyland and Shanghai Disneyland, but not Tokyo. Tokyo, yes. we did have to purchase a ticket. And Shanghai Disney and Hong Kong also do get cast member discounts for hotel rooms. They do not get discounts for anything in Tokyo Disney. I think your discount only works at Tokyo Disney if you go to a official Disney store, like you would have at your mall, but the stores in the parks and the hotels, the hotels themselves, food and beverage, nothing takes a discount from an overseas cast member ID. Yeah, and this is because Tokyo Disneyland is not technically owned by Disney, it's owned by Oriental Land Company, so mm -hmm. that's why there is a separation there. How much time do you think you need to do either just Tokyo, just Shanghai, or if you're going to do the trifecta and do all three Asian parks, how much time do you think you need to really see everything and feel like you got a really good taste of it all? So we did two weeks to do all the Asia parks. Our order was we went to Tokyo, we went to Hong Kong, then we went to Shanghai, and we went to Beijing just to end our trip to go to the Great Wall of China because in our trip, we wanted to see the culture outside of the parks. I thought two weeks was pretty great. We did a whole week solid though in Japan because we wanted to take a lot of time to do outside things like going to Hakone so we can see parts of Mount Fuji and on a bullet train. We went to Sanrio Pearl Land, which is Hello Kitty Land. That was amazing, by the way. Sanrio Pearl Land is definitely worth the trip if you're even like kind of interested in Hello Kitty and kawaii culture. Yes. That was like, that was like Disney part two. Even a week I felt was too short in Japan, but mm -hmm. we did three days in the park, uh, the rest of the week exploring the city. In the park, the tickets that we got, we got a three day park ticket, but the third day is the only day you can park hop. The first two days, they want you to spend a full day in each park. You can't just mix and match. So our first day we did Tokyo Disney Sea, and then the next day we went to Tokyo Disneyland. And then the third day, we were able to kind of conquer everything that we didn't get to do the first day in those parks. Yeah. yeah. And I would say I felt like we were able to do most everything. We missed Space Mountain and Splash Mountain, but because we have those at home, we figured we'd see the more unique offerings. Maybe Splash Mountain wasn't running. The day we left Tokyo, it actually snowed. So it tells you how cold it was. So we definitely, I don't think, had any desire to go on Splash Mountain either. We were in there in March. We yeah. couldn't have made it happen. And we got there at Park Open each day. So we put it in perspective too. If you're trying to see every show at the parks, it's kind of next to impossible. You would definitely need more than three days if you're trying to see all the shows. The shows and Tokyo Disney work as a lottery system. So each day you get to put your ticket into a machine and it'll tell you if you were successful or not successful. If you are successful, it tells you what show you want a ticket to. Otherwise, Aww. the shows in the park only allow you to queue for one of their showings. So Big Band Beat is a really popular show in Tokyo Disney Sea. So there's only one show where you're allowed to wait 
in line for it for standby. And that line was over three hours long. Or if you won the lottery for all the other five showings of that day, you got to just go in to your assigned seat. So if you're trying to see all the shows, you definitely need more than three days. It's very hard to see all the shows. Not talking about the parades, I'm just meaning the stage shows themselves. Even actually firework viewing, they have benches, and you would actually have to win a seat to watch the fireworks from that viewing area. You can watch it from far away, but if you want the good spot, you need to win a ticket. Yeah, so essentially I would say two weeks, we fit everything in. One week in Tokyo, one week splitting up Hong Kong and China. That part was rushed because we basically got one or one and a half days in the theme park and then one day in the city. So if I was to do it again, I think I would prefer to do two weeks in Tokyo solid and yes. then do Hong Kong and Shanghai in one trip and see more of China. Or if I was to do it all together and I had the luxury of three weeks, I'd probably do at least three weeks for both Disney parks and sightseeing. Yes, that's. I think that's a great answer. You definitely can conquer it all in two weeks. I know it's hard for a lot of people to get vacation for longer than two weeks. You definitely are able to get a good sense of all the parks. Two days in Shanghai was enough for us, I believe. Two days in Hong Kong was pretty good because Hong Kong is, I think it's actually smaller than Disneyland. So you definitely can conquer a lot. And luckily they had the smallest amount of weights for any of the attractions. It's definitely up to your own discretion but of course the more time the better because there's just so much to explore speaking of traveling bobby what are some particular things you think it's important to pack when you're traveling to asia and the asian disney parks the first thing that came to my mind was washcloths because the bathrooms do not have paper towels for you to dry your hands with so you'll notice in the park you'll be wondering like why i see all these cute washcloths everywhere with all these Disney characters. <laughs> yes, I always wondered about that. And they're very cute. Yes. I bought so many washcloths because they have amazing designs. Yes. Think about how handy, like, fun face masks are currently here. So that's how, like, trendy and fun, like, the amount of washcloths are out there. Like, you see them at every cash register. Uh, but, yes, definitely have those washcloths ready. When you're going to Beijing and Shanghai, outside the parks, definitely bring toilet paper. There are some locations that just have the squatty potties where there is no toilet paper provided. And that's more so in China. I would say not at Disney itself, but if you're traveling through China, there's often not toilet paper in the restrooms. Yeah, especially at, at restaurants, I found. Mm -hmm. uh, no, outside the bathroom, you should bring definitely... <laughs> A power adapter, and with that, definitely a portable charger. If you're traveling, definitely get a passport card. That's like a second option, and it's just something you put in your wallet. It looks like a license, uh, does the same thing, so you can leave your passport, hmm. and you're safe at your hotel, and then just bring your card. Did you get it, like, at the post office? I got mine in the mail. Did you order it online? I think so, yeah. Okay. My mom and I got ours together in the mail, so. Just curious. Yeah. yeah. Great tip. Yeah, get oh, your passport really card. Love that. What do you think sets the Asia parks apart from the U.S. ones just for those people who are used to going to Disneyland or Walt Disney World and are maybe thinking down the road if they want to go? So the main difference is definitely the set of rules that are in the parks. So for parade viewing, if you're there early, they expect you to sit for the performances, like if it's on the street. So if you're sitting, if you're like by the curb, they expect you to sit on the curb. Um, and then the people that are touching the rope behind you are the ones that are going to be allowed to stand. When it comes to character greetings, they're very strict on things like characters can't hold props and stuff with you for the pictures. Like Jess and I were obviously together on our trip, but it's like you can do an individual or a group picture. There's not both options. So if Jess went first and then I went, they're like, oh, can we get a picture with Ariel together? They would tell you no. There's no guaranteed sets. There's no set times. If you're at a location like Ariel's Grotto where the character is going to be there all day, they will actually hand you a sheet that tells you the rules for that location saying one type of photo, group or single only, asking the characters to pose, they tell you it's like a certain amount of time and they're gonna say, they're just gonna go in front of your camera and say, thank you so much, have a good day. And they just keep waving in front of your camera until you get out of the wow. way. Wow, yeah. As many of you guys may see on Instagram, you'll, you'll see like Esmeralda out, the Aristocats, 
Uh, we call our scary godmother. Yeah. Also known as the fairy godmother. She may look a little different to you guys when you go to Tokyo. But if you think you're going to go to Tokyo and you're going to see Esmeralda, that's not a guaranteed thing. It's still sporadic. So those characters that are roaming outside are not every day. So you can't just expect to see someone you see on Instagram. There's days of, or weeks that they won't show up in the park. It is spontaneous. That's why there's no set times. No one is guaranteed to be out unless they have indoor locations such as Mickey Mouse in his house in Toontown, Minnie Mouse in her house, Ariel in the grotto. Those are the friends that are always going to be guaranteed. It's really fun though and they have cute overlays and an overlay is an outfit that's different. It could be a seasonal overlay or it could be just to match the land they're in. So sometimes you'll see Stitch in Tomorrowland and he's not wearing any type of costume, but in Tokyo Disney Sea by the temple is wearing an outfit that matches the land. So when you see him on a different day, he can look completely different in a brand new outfit. Characters are definitely an extreme difference out there in Asia. Yeah, and you have like Indiana Jones, who doesn't even exist in the U.S. parks. Mm-hmm. Angel from Lilo and Stitch, the TV show. The three Cute. caballeros throughout. Yeah, very random characters. Oh, that- the monkeys from the Jungle Book. They were just roaming. Yeah. It's so interesting how that is actually effective there. I remember here a few years ago, they were like, we're going to have Gaston do roaming sets. He's just going to be walking around Fantasyland. Yeah. And so there's Gaston just walking around Fantasyland and everyone was like just on top of him and because they weren't used to it they're used to waiting in a line meeting a character doing the whole interaction and walking away so it was like they were trying to retrain the american guests and they were not having it and i think a lot of that has to do with the cultural differences over in japan everyone's very polite also if they find that they're are people forming a section where there is a cast member door, they will have no entertainment come out. Oh, like, they'll just punish you? They'll be like, they, yes, they, <laughs> they will punish the guests. There will be days, if people are waiting, that that character never goes out. That's like due to people leaking set times, but mm. don't oh. form a line, don't form a round, just have your eyes opened. And don't have expectations for who you want to see either. Exactly. I think it's better to be detached and be delightfully surprised by running into a character rather than yeah, it's so trying fun to find one. To see the seven dwarves just marching down Fantasyland by Dumbo. It's just a fun, different experience. And I would say a lot of this discussion we're having right now is about Tokyo specifically. In Hong Kong and Shanghai, there were more lines and more sets, I would say. Oh, but yeah. there was still some roaming. They have their characters listed on the apps, unlike Tokyo Disney. Mm-hmm. And then And also, when you're planning your trip to Tokyo Disney, if you have an American SIM card, the app does not work. So you can't see any of the wait times or anything if you are using an American phone trying to use their app. Mm. All the other parks, the apps in Hong Kong, Shanghai, allow you to see everything and it works. But if you are using a phone from overseas in Tokyo, it will not work. And I would say one other thing that's a little bit different there is their fast pass systems. Some of them still had printed tickets, like Tokyo. Mm-hmm. Um, Shanghai, we did have to book on the app. And in Shanghai, which I think is actually kind of cool, some people might not agree, is that you could buy additional fast passes. Yes. I like that oh, option. Yeah. We bought one for Pirates of the Caribbean yeah. because in your desperate hour, you can just be like, you know what? I'm just going to buy one for... Yeah, for one ride. That's yeah. so nice. Yeah. So... You know, it's nice to have the option, but it's nice to have the free option as well. Yeah. Okay, so the next question we have, we would like to know how you would differentiate what makes each park unique. So if you want to give us like a couple points of what makes Tokyo unique, Hong Kong unique, and Shanghai unique. Yeah, so I'm going to start with Shanghai. Shanghai definitely has, since it's the newest, groundbreaking technology. So the animatronics you're going to see are going to take your breath away. Your your jaw will drop because everything just looks so real. They're on a whole nother level when it comes to that aspect in the park. What did you think about Shanghai? I agree. I immediately thought of Peter Pan. The Peter Pan attraction is unreal in Shanghai. Kind of an unexpected favorite because, Mm -hmm. I mean, I always love Peter Pan, but it's next level there. And Pirates of the Caribbean, like I mentioned before. I definitely was blown away by Pirates, Peter Pan, and Tron. But we will be getting Tron over here at Magic Kingdom. So you guys can look for that here. For Tokyo Disney, 
I thought that this was going to be the best merchandise park, but surprisingly, that ended up being Hong Kong for me. Hong Kong had more of an array of Duffy and Friend merchandise. Not that Tokyo didn't have good stuff, but I spent more money at Hong Kong. <laughs> but Tokyo Disney, to me, was the best architecture. Walking into the park, Tokyo Disney Sea, that's the only Disney park I went to in the world where I actually cried walking into because it was so beautiful. My body did not know how to respond just at the entrance. And then when I saw Mermaid Lagoon, which is basically Atlantica for all yeah. the Little Mermaid fans, I was crying. It's so beautiful. And the architecture also completely changes at night by the way they have these areas lit. It looks like a completely different park at night versus day in Tokyo. So their architecture is amazing. And I will say that the food was the best in Tokyo Disney, in my opinion. And then Hong Kong, best merchandise, surprisingly. And I think that they have a surprising amount of offerings for like the attractions and the wait times are very surprising. I say that Hong Kong is the dream Disney vacation because it's what you would imagine Disneyland to be. Like how it looks in a commercial. Like when you walk through the park, there's so much space around you. Disneyland is clean, but even in Hong Kong, it's like the same park, but it's immaculate. But now the castle's got a huge upgrade, so I'm sure it's even cooler than Disneyland. Doesn't have the feel of Walt being in that park. Yeah, I remember us going to Tokyo, and we loved Tokyo, of course. We thought the merch was really cool. The rides were amazing. The architecture was amazing. But it was very crowded and kind of more chaotic. And I think when we went to Hong Kong, we were like, oh my gosh, this is just yeah. tranquil. It, Hong Kong is like a hidden gem. You know, you have Mystic Manor. You had Space Mountain with, it said five minutes, and they were walk-on. We rode... Space Mountain, Hyperspace Mountain, as our first ride in Hong Kong. We rode it three times in a row because there was no wait. Wow. Yeah, Hong Kong's amazing. So I guess a big part of planning a trip to the Asian Disney parks would be also planning where you're going to stay. Do you think in your experience that it's worth staying on property? I know that each park has a couple of resorts. So I guess tell us what they're like. Yeah, so when we stayed in Tokyo, we stayed at Tokyo Disneyland Hotel and the Marie Costo Hotel. I think I, I always say that one wrong. Say it for me, Jess. Miracosta. 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 Okay. <laughs> so we say Miracosta first, which is amazing. It's just like if you've ever been to California, the Grand Californian has a separate entrance into the park. So that's an amazing thing to take advantage of. If you're staying at the resort, you get to walk into the park in a separate entryway. So the theming of the Miracosta Hotel. It's Italy. It's the expansion of the area of the entryway of Tokyo Disney Sea. So you'll see like, the gondola boats yeah. from your room. You can see Fantasmic from your room. <gasps> we were there for when they were having Easter rehearsals. So they were doing the full Easter show while we were sleeping okay. <laughs> without audio on. So. That's a actually magical though. The hotels in Tokyo do not include transportation because the monorail itself is a real train station. They have Mickey shaped windows and they are <laughs> Disney themed. They're or, so cute. It's the cutest thing ever. And I, the I chimes. I cried. I cried the first yeah, time she cried. I went on it. That's so cute. And the chimes like play small world and stuff when you hit like the destinations. It's super cute and you get a special train ticket that has Disney characters on it. I had Daisy on mine. So the theming at Miracosta is amazing. And then the Tokyo Disneyland theming was crazy too. Yes. More so in the rooms, right? They rethemed their rooms every couple years. We got to stay in the Beauty and the Beast room. So yes, Kristen's barking, <laughs> barking footstool and all. The vanity bench is the barking footstool. I did. That's where I did my makeup. He's such an underrated part of that movie. And you get matching themed pajamas in your room. Wait, what? Yeah, yeah. They give them to you. Well, you don't get to keep them. It's kind of like bathrobes here in America, where they'll leave those in your room. They give you a full set of like long sleeve pajamas. pajamas with slippers. You get to keep the slippers. Okay, I remember seeing this picture of you guys and Maria wearing these. Mm -hmm. Pajamas. Mm -hmm. I was like, oh, that's so cute. They bought matching pajamas. Wait, what? Yes. Yeah. And going. Goodbye. And the rooms all give.
give you amenity kits for everyone. This is for all the Asian hotels. They give you um, a metal tin kit that has a sewing kit inside. It has toothpaste, toothpaste, toothbrushes, floss, I mean, napkins. It has everything you could think of. Really? And that's why when we have guests at Walt Disney World that come from Asia, they will come and be like, there's no toothbrush in my room. And so, yeah, they all oh. include that. Mm-hmm. So the pajamas and the slippers, it's all just like part of the room. I love it. And then, so we stayed at Miracosta and Tokyo Disneyland Hotel in Tokyo. And then Explorers Lodge at Hong Kong Disneyland. Uh, love that. That is Alani meets Animal Kingdom Lodge. Meets Adventureland. Yes, it's so beautiful. The food is great. Also, keep in mind, if you ever order water anywhere at the resorts or in the parks, it's going to be steaming hot water because they don't drink cold water. Do they have bottled water like to, to buy? Can you purchase bottled water that's cold? I don't remember it necessarily being cold. It would be probably lukewarm. Yeah. Ice is kind of How did rare. you survive? Isn't that a great question? I always need ice in my water. Anytime so. or anywhere, she's like, ice water with lemon. Yeah. <laughs> I just know that every morning we would just take the, they would put new bottles of water in the fridges at any Disney hotel we stayed at. And that was kind of the commitment. I'd always just would grab the two bottles. It was kind of like two bottles for each person in the room. Yeah. And we stayed at the Toy Story Hotel in Shanghai. Toy Story was pretty convenient. The Toy Story Hotel is considered the value resort of Shanghai Disney. It's cool because they still have roaming characters in the lobby from Toy Story. You still, you know, as a value resort, get all like, the amenity kits. You get the slippers. They have a good quick service, I would say, as well. And they had great transportation. Um, for Hong Kong and Shanghai, it was bus transportation from the resorts only. Um, not a train like in Tokyo Disney. I thought overall... It was just like staying at one of the newly renovated Pop Century rooms was how I felt the Toy Story accommodations were. Yeah, I agree. So I think if I was to skip one, probably Shanghai. Yeah, but they have a grand hotel that's very nice. But that one did not have a cast member discount. That's the only reason we didn't stay there. Is that the Shanghai Disneyland Hotel? Yes. I'm looking at it right now on the website and I'm like, okay. Yeah. <laughs> so I guess it sounds like these hotels are pricey, like they're expensive. But it sounds like the convenience the amenities like the things that are provided for you that you don't have to worry about in the proximity to the parks it almost sounds like you know if you're gonna save up and do this trip you might as well just do it you know yeah i would say that if you can do it it's worth it yeah and the themings the themings unbelievable and i think what we really lucked out with is we were all splitting the rooms because it was me bobby and akio sometimes our friend maria too so that Mm -hmm. did help with the price point. And, so bring friends. <laughs> yeah, and the lodging is very easy because if you have three people, a lot of the rooms have three beds already, but additionally, the couches are usually always pull outs. The rooms are set up as like one king bed, two queen beds, or if they had three twin beds, it would be a pull out couch. I saw that that's how like, the layouts were for the Disney area. Yeah, and it is very convenient. Like they had laundry mats too. So how we were traveling for two weeks, we tried to pack as light as possible. So we had the convenience of washing our clothes at the hotel. I think out of all of them, I preferred Explorers Lodge was my favorite. Mm-hmm. And then Tokyo was pretty much on par with that. So ultimately, if you can stay at the Disney resorts and you're a Disney person, we recommend it. If you want to save a buck or two, pick and choose. Yeah, I know a lot of people that stay on the nearby um, Hiltons. Mm -hmm. Those are nice. They're very popular around there. Some of the Hilton resorts that are surrounding those theme parks also include a shuttle service, but that one's going to have set to like three set times of the day where they do pickups and drop-offs, whereas if you stay on property, it's going to be continuous pickup and drop-off. What would you say the biggest challenge is we faced in Asia were? So the biggest challenges we faced in Asia, one I brought up earlier was, you know, the transportation outside of the resorts, which would be like the cabs going off property. The next thing I would say would be the check-in process. And we were very lucky. Every place we went to let us go in the luggage room actually and like get our clothes and we would change. And because we would fly in comfy clothes and then we would change at the resort before going into the park because we couldn't wait to like go in like we had to go right away 
So we had changed in the bathroom. I mean, like straightening hair, everything, like full on in the bathrooms. But what's really funny is you can ask them, oh, is my room ready? And it's like 10 a.m. They go, yes, the room is ready. You're like, oh, can I go now? They go, no, it's not 3 p.m. Like it's- wanting something yeah. without an egg and then being like, well, we can do that, but we're not going to. <laughs> exactly. They're like, oh, yeah, like the room is ready. It's it's clean. It's all done. Housekeeper left at 10, 15 a.m. And it's, it's 12. But no, it's not 3, so you can't go in. That's something that was like kind of a challenge, but they were able to accommodate unless, like, you know, they always had someone walk us into the luggage room and get our stuff. Working in resorts here, like people expect to check in and have the room ready as soon as possible, but technically a check-in time is 3 p.m. and a room is not guaranteed typically at any resort until after 5 p.m. So it's just funny that they can tell you there that your room is ready and they can tell you your room number basically, but they won't let you go in it. Yeah, so... Big differences from America, but again, like one of our biggest tips is to be super flexible when you're there because things are just different than what you're used to. And the more you can go with the flow, the better time you're going to have. Yeah. And when you're going outside into the city, sometimes you will find a language barrier. Yeah, I still felt like it was a little tricky at the Disney resorts too. So I think biggest tip for language barriers is use lots of hand gestures Pick very clear, well-known words yeah. in English if you're going to try to communicate that way. And Google Translate. And <laughs> Google Translate or a Translate app because that will be your best friend, especially because Chinese and Japanese languages use characters instead of the alphabet like we do. Um, it's definitely very helpful to use a Translate app. Yeah. Even though it won't be 100% accurate all of the time. Exactly. I have the understanding that just because you typed it doesn't mean that it's going to align as a correct sentence for them. Yes. Because it will be words that they just don't even use in their own language. So I know we talked about how it's absolutely worth it to explore the city of Tokyo and the surrounding area around Tokyo Disneyland. But do you think it's equally worthwhile to explore Shanghai and Hong Kong. I would say definitely to explore outside of Disney because I think you're missing out on a huge cultural experience. It's a disadvantage to yourself to not go outside of the park. We always made sure that we did something that, you know, represented the culture in some way, whether it was going to a museum or like a shrine. And when we went to Hong Kong, we went to the peak Um, In Shanghai, we went to the Bund, and they are the skylines of the city, so you get to see the city come alive at night, and you'll see a lot of touristy things around that area, which also brings another great point. You definitely should go outside of Disney, that way you can try every McDonald's wherever you go, (laughs) and try the rare different things they have, like sesame chicken sandwiches or you know teriyaki burgers it was so fun going to mcdonald's at every place we went just to have the different food that was definitely a bobby thing yeah <laughs> and one other quick little stop we made like you said was beijing to go see the great wall mm-hmm. of china which i think was worth doing we did a thousand percent and we got to go to the summer palace as well our friend brady who has been working in shanghai disney for about three years now has gone to Beijing a couple of different times and said to use Catherine Liu tours. And I believe it's actually about $200 to have a private tour guide pick us up from our resort. It included our meals. And then from having our meals included and going to the Summer Palace and the Great Wall of China with a translator yeah. and transportation. Yeah. And I think that also include like the express pass to not wait in the full line to go up the ski lift to the Great Wall and included the transportation down, which is the... The uh, toboggan. Toboggan, yes. <laughs> we tobogganed. Like you said, definitely so many things to do outside of the parks. And again, in Tokyo, we did Hakone to see the same structure as the Japanese pavilion in Epcot. Yes, the gate. The gate. For the shipping goods. Mm-hmm. Um, from there, if depending on the weather, you can see Mount Fuji. We went to an on-scene that had multiple different pools and water slides. And we also went to Asakusa to see more architecture. We did Sanrio Puroland to see Hello Kitty and Friends and Shibuya Crossing. And Harajuku, all kinds of different things. And Harajuku, which was our favorite fashion district and I got my nails done at the best place. I'll link it in the show notes. I got Aladdin and Jasmine nails. That was the best experience of my life. 
it was just art. So we're going to do some rapid fires to wrap up the episode. Thank you so much for sharing all of this information with us, Bobby. Yes. We're going to do Disney rapid fire questions Asia style. All right. Ready? So I'm ready. First question. Favorite Asia park? Tokyo Disney Sea. Hands down. Mermaid Lagoon is the best. Favorite Asia attraction? Journey to the center of the earth or 20,000 leagues under the sea in Tokyo Disney. Oh, and... Who's Honey Hunt? Oh my gosh, in Tokyo Disneyland. Amazing. Next question. Favorite Asia show? Wow, that sounds all biased. I'll say Big Band Beat. No, it's all Tokyo Disney Sea. Um, that and King Trion's concert. Oh, that's But I'm an Ariel fan, so it's all gonna be. That's a thing? Yeah, Ariel swims above you and does the show with her sisters. It's absolutely what? amazing. What? It's really cute. Wait, what? Yeah. I'm gonna cry every day. Okay. Favorite Asia resort? Uh, definitely the Art Beauty and the Beast room and at the Tokyo Disneyland Hotel and at Marie Costa. Marie Costa. <laughs> Marie Costa. I love that room because I love how you can see the inside of the park. Favorite food that you got to try in Asia? The Waywinder all Tokyo Disney. <laughs> oh my gosh. The quick service attached to the 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea. They had a the deal. Yeah. It was where you get to pick five different um, types of Asian cuisine with a drink and a dessert. And that was amazing. That was like a taste testing thing. It yeah. was so good. I think that was the moment you shifted from your picky eater to having an elaborate palate. You just yes. needed a good tasting menu. For sure. Okay. Favorite memory from your Asia trip with Jess? Oh, okay. Well, I would say the going through, like finishing the Great Wall of China. That's not in the parks. So that's my favorite Asian memory. No, that, that's awesome. That's just something that's so crazy to say you've done. When you go on soaring and you like look at it, you're like, I've been there. Yeah, yeah. And that's that with amazing. Jess, that was so cool. That was amazing. amazing. And yeah. I just want to throw in my favorite Asia memory was when we walked into Atlantica at Tokyo Disney Sea, and Bobby saw it for the first time, and he is one of the biggest Little Mermaid fans yes. I know, and he just cried tears of pure joy and. It was so magical with the background music and the architecture and just the whole... The whole experience. It was the kickoff to our trip there, and it was just a moment that I will remember forever. So, okay, I'm glad we got to share that together. (laughs) So, Bobby, we have some questions that we ask everyone that we have as a guest on our show. (laughs) You're like, okay. Yes, I'm like, I'm (laughs) ready. I'm ready for this. (laughs) I'm ready for this. And they just really align with kind of what we're about and what everyone that we like to do life with is really about too. So just take it away. All right. So first question, Bobby, Mm -hmm. what does living authentically mean to you? So to me, living authentically just truly means being yourself. I'm a person that I say I don't believe in guilty pleasures. I call them guiltless pleasures, which is the name of my podcast. We'll um, link it for you. A random plug in there. We will link it for but you. <laughs> I think you should live your life. You should share your interests and never be embarrassed by them because that's what makes you you. So I think being authentic is just always being that open and sharing what you love and who you love with everyone. I think that's the true way to live authentically. If you could travel to one place anywhere in the world right now, it can be Asia. Where would it be and why? Yeah, so my immediate thought is always to go back to Tokyo um, (laughs) because I felt, like I said earlier, that I did not get to do enough there. I would go there for a month just to feel like I was able to do everything on my list. We can move there if you want. Yeah, (laughs) I would love to do that. On my bucket list, the next would be Greece. Um, Just because I think it's just beautiful. I really want to go to Mykonos and... Don't we I just... It just looks so fun. Okay, what is one thing you would be doing every day of your life if your life were free of limitations? <laughs> Something I'd be doing every day? Well, I would definitely be shopping a lot more. <laughs> um, <laughs> that would be my job. If Yay. I had, if life had no limitations. Mm-hmm. Money, time, everything. Yeah, I would travel as much as possible and have homes in as many places as possible. That's awesome. This is literally why you guys are friends. I know. Like you both have such wanderlust and I love it. <laughs> so I talk a lot about being childlike, not childish, because I think there is a very distinctive differentiation between the two. And obviously like as Disney people, we know that. But I guess what is one childlike quality that you think would be beneficial if adults implemented it into their daily lives? First thing that comes to my mind with that is compassion for strangers when you're a kid, if, like, you see someone fall, like, your immediate reaction is, like, are you okay? Like, you, like, run to that person. Like, there's an openness 
to where it's not socially awkward to go up to someone Mm -hmm. and to say something or to help them. There's like this part of curiosity that you want to have and to explore when you're with your mom. If you see something that's different and you ask, oh, like, what is that? And then like you find out and you just have a compassion to want to help, I feel like, more people. And then I think sometimes as you're older, that can get jaded. Mm -hmm. But I think as a child, you have a compassion that's so brand new and strong that you are willing and wanting to help everyone and everything to be good. Like it's uninhibited when you're yeah. a kid because you don't know anything else. Like, it's yeah, it's seeing the good and everything. It's, well, yeah. I know when you guys went to Asia that you pretty thoroughly documented it. So oh, yeah. Yes. Where can we find the evidence to support all of these great tips and stories? Yes. So we made very thorough Asia vlogs from day one to the end of the trip and they are on my YouTube channel Jessica Faye and we'll link them in the show notes below we love to watch them through yes I love watching them because it's like reliving the whole trip we filmed every single day and pretty much everything we did so and Bobby one last thing yeah if our listeners just loved connecting with you today, how can they continue to connect with you online, on Instagram? You can plug your podcast. Yeah. Tell us where we can find you. Yes. So, yes, I have my own podcast called Guiltless Pleasures with Bobby Asin, and that's on Spotify and iTunes. And then all my social media, whether it's TikTok, Instagram, and Twitter, at Bobby Asin, B-O-B-B-Y-A-S-E-N, is where you can find me. I love that we have a TikToker on. Yeah. We're so Gen Z over here now. (laughs) Thank you so much for being here today. Thank you guys for having me. This was so fun to relive the trip again and talk about all the tips because we really learned so much. Yeah. For sure. I feel like I learned so much as someone who's never been to Asia. Yeah. I I think this is so valuable. So I hope if you're thinking about going that this will kind of release you from some anxieties surrounding traveling to a foreign country. And if you are planning a trip, I hope that this was really helpful. I know that once all this is over, I am getting myself to Tokyo so I can yep, cry in Atlantica. Open. <laughs> yes, this definitely was a great podcast for daydreaming about your next trip after COVID. And of course, anything we said today is subject to change just due to the pandemic. However, I'm sure that there will be plenty of resources to help you find your way post-COVID. And we will link everything that Bobby and Jess spoke about in the show notes, as well as Jess's YouTube channel, so you can actually watch the vlogs. And thank you so much, Bobby, for being here with us. Yes, I appreciate the offer to join you guys. Yeah, thank you. We're going to go eat lunch at Sanaa now because we are late for a reservation. So thank you guys so, so much for listening. And... We'll talk to you next Tuesday. Bye. We hope you've enjoyed this episode of Rediscover. Please subscribe and leave us a review wherever you're listening. Your reviews are what keep us going, and we'd love to hear from you. Join us every Tuesday for a new conversation, and let us know what you think we should talk about next. Follow us on Instagram at positively.kristen and at jessicafay508. And check out Jess's blog at theroadjesstraveled with one L.com. Until next time, stay frumpy.